Greetings, everyone. It's a great pleasure to come to you today and uh, acknowledge two special people in my life. And the first is Sergio Gianzini, who's the president of the UIP and president of the uh, International V Win Foundation, and uh, his dedication around the world, along with Oscar Bottini and Willie Chi, is incredible, bringing the good news to everyone everywhere. And you can see him pictured there with me because he helped uh, with the phrase, uh, never treat a stranger, never kill a friend. And uh, I'm very uh, happy to be working with him and working with all of his colleagues around the world. The other person today is Professor Alfonso Tafur. Now, every uh, person like myself who's practiced uh, for almost 50 years, one of the greatest things that can ever happen to you is to have somebody come along to take over what you've been doing and take it to the next level, taking the good that you've done uh, and making it better. And Alfonso Tufour, who came to us uh, from the Mayo Clinic and the University of, of Oklahoma as a vascular medicine specialist, and he's a younger, brighter, humbler, version of me. And in addition, oh, by the way, he has a photographic memory. And he also went ahead and got a, a, a MBA. So he understands the business side of medicine as well as the patient side. He's an incredible healthcare provider. And he has taken what I have started and made it even much better. And he's helped uh, actually get the Caprini score into widespread use at my own hospital, which they uh, it took them a while to, uh, to do. And so I'm very indebted to him. Recently, he published a, a, a video for Sergio in order to give him a flavor because I've gotten the two of them together and I think that together they're going to make great strides in carrying forward the message around the world of venous thromboembolism prophylaxis and preventing fatal pulmonary emboli. So uh, it's a great honor for me today to introduce the video by Alfonso Tafur made for Sergio Genzini. So let's get on with the show. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to uh, Professor Giancini for giving me the opportunity uh, to share these two cents uh, on uh, things that I care about as a vascular medicine physician. Um, I'm a clinician. One of the things that I see the most is venous thromboembolism in multiple settings. One of them, preventable post-hospitalization thrombosis. Uh, and I want to share in uh, auspices by Professor Giancini a view of uh, where, in my opinion, the opportunity might be and what I often forget because uh, it's uh, really about head, hands, and heart when I think about how to make a change. Uh, why, why head? Because if I go back into some time now, so back in the 1990s, uh, I look into the first Medinox trial. So you divide three groups of patients, uh, enoxaparin 20, enoxaparin 40, and placebo, to try to prevent in medically ill individuals, non-surgical, uh, who may actually be prevented against thrombosis. Now, patient selection, patient selection, patient selection, I'll repeat that. Uh, they actually selected patients uh, with uh, heart failure or respiratory failure, uh, or perhaps acute infections, rheumatological disorders, inflammatory bowel disease, in addition to uh, extra risk factors, for instance, older age, uh, cancer, a prior thrombosis, obesity, hormonal therapy, varicose veins. So in that setting, uh, they were able to prove a clear reduction of thrombosis when the patients were given between six and 14 days of prevention so not just in hospital necessarily, but 16 to 14 days. And they managed to reduce the rate of thrombosis venographically from 14, almost 15% to 5.5. So a clear reduction, no major bleeding increase. Later on, Artemis, very similar design, now two main groups, 
850 individuals, give or take, all of them over 60 years old. And again, patient selection, similar intervention with fondaparinox this time around, 2.5 milligrams, 6 to 14 days, and basically same concept. They were able to reduce without major bleeding risk the rate of thrombosis venographically from 10, 10.5% to uh, 5.6, so a clear reduction on risk. Uh, so many years later, actually last year, uh, you have the symptoms trial. Now, interestingly, they actually utilized an oxaparin uh, for the simple fact that you were older than 70. Now, granted, we're not able to get to the many patients they actually wanted. They got short on that, but it was a negative trial. So what do I learn about this small trajectory that when I need to prophylax in hospital and for six for 14 to 14 days, it has to be patient selection and right amount of time. The trajectory took quite a turn for, for many years, really. I'm seeing papers here from 2010 to really recently, actually, because uh, this story perhaps finishes with the Michelle trial uh, positive uh, in patients with COVID post-hospitalization. Uh, which we did along with uh, uh, Professor Ramachotti. But specifically on the pre-COVID era, uh, the EXCLAIM trial tried to convince us that maybe we should go ahead and give prevention for a bit longer. So 28 plus minus four days and noxaparin in this setting, 40 milligrams, uh, versus standard of care. Uh, and indeed there was a reduction, uh, but there was a concern for bleeding. So that was really never heavily adopted. ADOPT trial uh, was trying to do the same with Apixaban. Right trend, but didn't get there. Magellan and Mariner actually put Rivaroxaban on the map as a, a good strategy for this. And regretfully, Betrixaban also did so uh, with the Apex trial, but it went to fade out and uh, no longer accepted uh, or available, at least in the United States. So let me spend a little bit more on the Mariner trial because it actually had a different and yet important concept. So it utilized patient selection, not only from the thrombosis risk, uh, also it's important to make sure that we exclude the patients who are high risk of bleeding. And in this setting, they actually utilized the improved score enriched by um, D-dimers. So, so basically an improved score uh, of four or higher or a D-dimer uh, positive plus an improved score of two to three would actually classify you as a candidate for uh, prophylaxis. 12,000 patients, uh, basically the symptomatic non-fatal pulmonary embolism uh, rate went from 0.44 to 0.18. So why do I learn from this trajectory? Uh, again, patient selection and uh, as Peter Drucker may have said, it's not just about what you sell, but what you don't. Uh, it's also about then, about the patients who you do not want to prophylax. So, so to this end, uh, on the extended journey, you come up with this idea. Uh, and this reminds me, when, when I was about to enter uh, to Mayo Clinic for residency, uh, I was lucky enough to have a rotation, first of all. Uh, and during that rotation, I remember seeing Everywhere in the walls, uh, this story of let's go for it, let's gonna eliminate VTE uh, so everybody gets prophylax if they get in the hospital. Uh, and they actually implemented for so many years in universal VTE prevention. Uh, so, so by the time I was actually finishing uh, my residency and then vascular medicine fellowship there, uh, well, people were celebrating that we were actually had achieved a uh, more than 90% uh, almost universal prophylaxis delta parin uh, on patients uh, on hospitalization. Now, John Hyde, actually, Professor Hyde, did an analysis uh, later on from the data on 2005, 2010. And uh, regretfully, uh, two things we learned. Uh, one, that universal prophylaxis did not change the rate of post-hospitalization medically ill BDE. So it didn't work. Uh, and number two, we learned that 75% 75%, three out of four patients with uh, post-hospital VTE were the medically ill patients. So again, I've learned patient selection matters and that one size does not fit all. So, so then the guidelines have 
paid attention to that, and they do actually express a concept of uh, VTE risk on patient selection. And this summarizes some of the uh, guidelines, including the newest one, in my uh, knowledge, uh, the IUA perspective, which I think is very comprehensive. And, and the, by timing, was able to adapt some of the concept of the extended prevention to actually say and suggest very clearly, consider extended prevention, so post-hospitalization extension on those patients who are at higher risk. So if I now know what to do, I have a head, but that's not enough. So, so when I when I say that the promise is active clinical decision support, CDS, uh, the first thing that comes to mind, maybe that little robot over there, but that's, that's not what I mean. Uh, what I mean is something uh, more usable. So this is actually one of my patients uh, in uh, the hospital. We created uh, an, a version of the Caprini score, the eCaprini, we call it, in which multiple of the variables are abstracted real time. Every 30 minutes, it gets re-updated. And it sends nudges, we call it, so uh, little bits of information to the whoever opens the chart, telling them, hey, you know what, this patient may benefit from X. This patient may need that. Uh, this, uh, this patient is not getting um, adequate prevention. Of course, you can opt out, uh, but uh, it nudges you to actually um, think about prophylaxis in patient. Now, you may say, Caprini, uh, which I was lucky to work with here in a, um, and they were for many years, um, is best for surgical patients. Well, I agree, it's a surgical patient uh, a scoring system. We did this validation in over 60,000 patients uh, internally. Uh, I would argue that we just didn't want to have two scores in the institution. Now, that being said, uh, I'm not necessarily committed to a single score, uh, to Caesar what Caesars. I think the improved score with Alex Spiropoulos categorically has done a fantastic job in the medically ill population. And, and the proof is in the pudding with this relatively recent uh, manuscript in which uh, Professor Spiropoulos, uh, Alex did a cluster randomized trial. So what that means is he actually, he actually randomized full hospitals. So he had four hospitals at disposal uh, two of them ended uh, getting this CDS, and two of them did not. So out of 19,000 patients initially absorbed, 10,000 patient data, when you improve this uh, uh, utilization and notch the clinicians, you tell them that there is a, a higher scoring systems, uh, the probability of adequate prophylaxis for inpatient and also at discharge increased 80%. Percent, eight zero, eighty uh, percent. Then uh, that's not it. Uh, actually, the rate of thrombotic events, the holy grail, the rate of thrombotic events, including venous and arterials, actually decreased. So total thromboembolism rates went from four to two point nine percent, significant uh, confidence interval. So, so when I say uh, this system is the, the hands that we need. Uh, I insist that is true, but that's not enough. Uh, one of the best uh, or simplest, I would say, um, change management models that I love is uh, unfreeze, change, and freeze. And what I mean with that is the example that you saw in COVID. During COVID, quoting again the Michelle trial, for example, we had a sense of urgency and we had a sense of community and we all knew so we had to do something. I remember I see a CMO calling and saying, hey, we had our first pulmonary embolism post-COVID hospitalized, and we don't even have space for more people here. And what do we do? So we implemented, really anchored in the improved score, uh, we implemented uh, an extended prevention plan for high-risk uh, COVID patients, uh, and we just did that, even though we didn't have any specific data on it. So with that knowledge, we later on helped design actually the Michelle trial, and we proved that we actually did right uh, a, a very nice uh, number needed to treat to utilize serelto prevention in post-COVID hospitalization. So we had the urgency, we were able to make the change, and then the freezing, the freezing is actually making sure that you have institutional support and community buy-in so that we keep that information locked. And we probably include it in, let's say here, the scorecards, for example, of our community and our hospitals. So, so we have hands, and that's still not enough. 
Uh, what we also need is uh, to be persuasive, to be convincing, to have the heart and emotion when we do that. And uh, this is a nice, simple system. Uh, it's called STEPS. Uh, so social uh, currency. So we make people applaud it when they're doing things right. Uh, you get triggers and remember, you get emotion, uh, publicly show it. I mean, which is a bit hard in prevention because often prevention is celebrating what you don't see, but uh, but we need to look into ways of um, validating this as well. Uh, create practical value. So demonstrate that this is actually important. And we can do that with storytelling of which are the things that go right. So, so ultimately, uh, what I would propose and has been a bit of a, my own trajectory on the paradigm of VT prevention is that we cannot live with heads alone. When we try to move communities, uh, we need to have heads, have hands, and have heart uh, to make a change. Thank you much.